afternoon, everyone. My name is Nora Volkov, and I'm the director of the National Institute on Drug Abuse at the NIH. And it's a real pleasure for me to introduce Dr. Xiaowei Shuang, who is a professor of chemistry and chemical biology and professor of physics at Harvard University. Um, she, Dr. Shuang, pioneered the development of single molecule super resolution and genomic scale imaging methods for the studies of biological systems. Among the methods include STORM, a super resolution imaging method, and, and using it, she discovered novel, novel cellular structures. Another method is MERFISH, a single cell transcriptome imaging method that allows her to elucidate gene expression regulation in cells and the molecular identities, spatial organization, and functions of cells in tissues. A third method is a multiplex fish method that allows direct visualization of the three-dimensional organization of chromatin in the cell nucleus. Dr. Shuang did her undergraduate degree in physics from the University of Science and Technology of China. She did her PhD degree in physics under the supervision of Professor G.R. Shen from the University of California at Berkeley. Her postdoctoral training in biophysics in the lab of Professor Stephen Shu at Stanford University. She joined Harvard's faculty in 2001 and became a Howard Hughes medical investigator in 2005. Dr. Swan has received numerous awards and honors, including membership in both the United States and Chinese Academy of Sciences, and has been the recipient of some of the most prestigious science awards for her accomplishments in biophysics and neuroscience. Her presentation title is Single Cell Transcriptome Imaging and Brain Cell Atlas. And before I leave you with her, I want to remind the audience to please type your questions in the question and answer box during the presentations. I enjoy, enjoy the presentation. Thank you for the kind introduction. It's my great pleasure to speak at the sixth annual uh, Brain Initiative Investigator Meeting. So I will talk about our uh, recent work on the single cell transcriptome imaging method that my lab developed and uh, our application of this method to uh, generate a cell analysis of a couple of uh, brain regions. So first, let me give you a motivation of why we want to develop a single cell transcriptome imaging method. Now, we know that animals are made of uh, many different types of cells, and these cells have different behaviors and functions, largely because they have uh, different gene expression profiles. And therefore, being able to quantify the RNA expression profile or the transcriptome of individual cells could greatly help our uh, understanding of the molecular origin of different cell behaviors. And indeed, the recent advance in single cell RNA sequencing has begun to transform many areas of biology. So then why do we want to develop an imaging-based single cell transcriptomics approach? Now, uh, one of the main reasons is because imaging-based approaches allow us to do spatially resolved measurements. And that is important to, in at least two fronts. And now at the cellular level, we know that RNAs are not uniformly distributed inside cells. And the local RNA distributions and uh, actions are actually important. It is an important post-transcriptional regulation form, and it is important for the uh, establishment and maintenance of local cellular structures, as described in this beautiful review by uh, Rob Singer. And uh, at a uh, tissue level, we also know, as I said, there are so many different types of cells, and these cells are also not uniformly distributed. And the spatial organization of the different cell types is actually important for the tissue function. So if we could actually do in situ single cell gene expression profiling, then we can identify the cell types in situ, and then with that directly map out the 
uh, functionally important spatial organization. So how do we do this? So uh, here's our idea. Uh, we use aerobust barcoding, combinatorial labeling, and sequential imaging to enable simultaneous measurements of numerous genes or numerous RNA species. So what we first do is we encode individual RNA species with unique barcodes, for example, binary barcodes. And then we use combinatorial labeling to physically imprint the barcodes onto each RNA molecule. So I'll explain how to do that. And then we sequentially image. We use sequential imaging to read out these barcodes bit by bit. Now, in the first round of uh, uh, labeling and imaging, we uh, image only those RNAs. Their first bit reads one, but not zero. And then we remove the signal. And in the second round, we read out those RNAs. Their second bit reads one, but not zero. And so on and so forth. So at the end of imaging, for each cell, we see many, many dots inside the cell. And each represents an RNA molecule. And then each one now has a string of binary barcode associated with it, so depending on which round of imaging that we detected. So then how do we actually label and image these uh, RNA in, in individual rounds. And we uh, use this uh, powerful single molecule fish method that's pioneered by Rob Singer and further advanced by Rob Singer, Arjun Raj, and others into a highly accurate and quantitative method, uh, method in which uh, individual RNAs are detected by a complementary oligo that's fluorescently labeled that allow us to image, locate, and count those RNA molecules. So how do we uh, achieve this uh, very large scale imaging or combinatorial labeling? This is what we do. So we first uh, add a, a high diversity library of encoding probes to the sample. And then each one of these encoding probes that have a target region that allow it to specifically recognize a target molecule. And these readout sequences that are determined by, you know, the target molecules uh, binary barcode, for example. So for example, if we have uh, the barcodes reads 1, 0, 1, 1, and so on, so then the encoding probe of this RNA would include, include readout sequence 1, but not 2, readout sequence 3 and 4, but not 5, and so on and so forth. And then once it's encoding step or the imprinting of the, encode, uh, of the codes that is finished, we then read out these barcodes bit by bit by using now readout probes that are fluorescently labeled and complementary to the readout sequences to detect, uh, you know, which bit of the barcodes reads one. So with this approach, uh, then we reached a uh, very large scale uh, <clears throat> imaging of numerous RNA uh, species, as I'll show you with an experimental proof later. But I also want to say that with this uh, two-step Re encoding and readout probe labeling, this also allows the cellular RNAs to be uh, labeled relatively fast. Now, one immediate advance uh, or advantage of this method is scaling. And you can see that after n-bit imaging or n-rounds imaging with single-color imaging or, uh, you know, uh, three-color imaging with n divided by three rounds of imaging, so how many different RNA species can we distinguish we can distinguish two to the n's of RNA. Now, uh, it, say if n is only equal to 16, that would allow already allow us to detect some 65,000 RNAs. Uh, but there is also a problem, and that problem is error propagation and accumulation. Now, even though, as I mentioned, single molecule fish is accurate, and that means for each bit the measurement error is small, but that error will add up from multiple bits. So uh, for, uh, for example, 16 bits, then that error could be very substantial. And we solved this problem by using codes that allows error detection and correction. For example, in this a Hemming code with a Hemming distance 4, that means between any pair of valid barcodes, four bit errors has to occur. Now, each bit occur with a relatively small chance, so then having four errors simultaneously occur in a message makes that chance even smaller. Moreover, if a single bit error occurs, we can actually detect that. And not only detect that, but also correct that, because 
that would generate a message that is close, uniquely close to a correct message and at least three errors away from other messages. So with that, we achieved both large-scale imaging and high accuracy. So we call this method multiplexed error robust fluorescence in situ hybridization, or MRFISH. So here is an experimental proof. As you can see in this uh, uh, first MRFISH paper, we imaged, uh, uh, in this case, 140 genes, uh, and then we can see that uh, the measurement results uh, correlate uh, very well with bulk sequencing, and then we can also compare with uh, single molecule fish for 15 of the uh, 140 genes and then get basically spot on agreement, which also shows a very high detection efficiency of this approach. And then we also detected a thousand genes and still get very good correlation with bulk sequencing. So in other words, so even in this initial work, we demonstrated the transcriptome scale imaging of a thousand genes. Now I should say that by using a single slide showing this, I really did not do justice to the tremendous amount of work that we actually did to make this uh, possible. It actually took us multiple years of effort between the conception of the idea and the publication of this paper. So uh, after conceiving the idea, I actually set our goal of the very first publication to be a thousand gene imaging to demonstrate the genome scale imaging experimentally. And as I said, it took us multiple years of hard work to overcome many challenges in labeling, imaging, analysis, and so on to reach this goal. And then more recently, uh, we scaled up further to show that uh, uh, we can image 10,000 genes, uh, gene more than 10,000 genes, uh, with basically the same approach and the same type of handling code, but just a longer code. And we maintain the very high detection efficiency and accuracy. So I should say that the high detection efficiency of uh, MRFISH is uh, another advantage of this uh, genome scale uh, measurement approach, for example, compared to uh, single cell RNA sequencing. So there are a variety of applications uh, that one could use this uh, MRFISH for. For example, I think these are single cell measurements, and then uh, in each uh, individual cell, so we measure the expression of many genes and then by comparing the genes, uh, their expression level, how do they vary from cell to cell, or uh, how do they co-vary from cell to cell, we can actually infer gene regulatory networks, as we've already done in our first paper. And then, obviously, we could measure the spatial organization of the RNAs uh, at the transcriptome scale inside the cell. And then we can measure the uh, spatial organization of cells in complex tissues. And we've also demonstrated uh, Using this approach, uh, we can do image-based high-throughput screening of uh, pulled genetic libraries, such as a CRISPR-based uh, pulled library approach, but actually screen based on the phenotypes that are only accessible by uh, imaging. And then we can also use multiplex to fish uh, to uh, measure uh, numerous uh, uh, chromatin loci and then use that to trace out the 3D organization of chromatin inside the cell. But in this work, as I mentioned in the beginning, we'll focus on our cell atlas effort. And the idea, again, is to use MRFISH to do in situ gene expression profiling of individual cells, and then to identify cell types based on these gene expression profiles, and then directly map out to the spatial organization of these cell types. And then I'll talk about our work in two different brain regions. And I'll first talk about our study of the uh, pre-optic region of the hypothalamus in collaboration with Catherine Dulux's work uh, lab. So uh, as uh, many of you know that uh, the hypothalamus, the preoptic region of the hypothalamus uh, controls or modulates uh, many social behaviors and essential homeostatic functions such as uh, sleep, feeding, uh, drinking, thermoregulation, and on the social behavior front such as parenting, mating, and an aggression. So uh, we actually took a two-prop approach uh, to uh, characterize the cells in the preoptic region, including both uh, single cell RNA sequencing and MRFISH measurements. Due to time limit, I'll only be able to talk about our results on MRFISH. And in this study, we imaged 155 genes, and these genes are selected to based on these three criteria. First, we uh, selected based on some known canonical uh, major cell type markers. 
And uh, we also have uh, many years of biological studies to tell us what are the functional important genes in the hypothalamus, such as the neuropeptides and receptors. And also, we uh, use the RNA single cell RNA sequencing results and uh, the cell cluster results to identify marker genes for these clusters, and then added uh, uh, 70 genes uh, to the uh, 85 uh, pre-selected genes, and then end up with 155 total genes for this panel. So uh, with this, you know, here if I show you all the genes for a single field of view, and this is what you can see, and then you can see individual cells, and you can see individual RNA molecules inside it, and then you can see their identity being color-coded. Now, with so many different genes showed up, you actually, uh, your eye cannot discern that many colors. But if I show, for example, only eight of the colors or eight of the genes here, then you can immediately tell things. For example, you can see these red cells, they express inhibitory neuronal marker GET1, so they're inhibitory neurons. And then these uh, blue cells or cyan cells uh, express uh, the excitatory uh, neuronal marker of glu 2 so these are excitatory neurons. And then these green cells are all oligodendrocytes and so on and so forth. Now, I also want to say that uh, our uh, imaging, actually, uh, the MRFISH after uh, multiple generations of development, and now it's a very high throughput approach that we can actually measure tens of thousands of cells in overnight experiment. So, uh, so this is actually the uh, whole area that we profiled in this work, and uh, that is a two millimeter by two millimeter by around one millimeter volume, and then you can see the two millimeter by two millimeter view. And then uh, you, by measuring so many genes, 155 of them, and then we can actually use those to do cell clustering, uh, use the graph-based community detection method. And then the clustering results, if we first look at the major cell classes level, then you can see that now these are the major cell classes that are uh, presented here by color. And, uh, it's, uh, and you can see some beautiful spatial organization. Not only that, if we actually just move from anterior to posterior, only about uh, 0.6 mil, uh, let me see, yeah, about 0.6 millimeter of range, and then you can see this uh, beautiful spatial organization to actually change quite dramatically. And uh, because we image 155 genes, we can not only by clustering get the major cell classes, we can actually get also the uh, neuronal subtypes. So in this work, in the, these, uh, these MRFISH images allow us to actually identify 70 different subtypes of neurons, and many of them are previously unknown. And of course, because of this, this direct spatial measurement, we get the spatial organization. And I'm not able to present 70 different colors and yet still uh, let it make sense to you. So, so what we uh, decided to show here is actually each row corresponds to one different uh, neuronal subtypes. And these are the 39 different inhibitory neurons. And then you can see their spatial organization and how does it change from the anterior to posterior. And likewise, we can see that for the 31 different uh, excitatory neuronal subtypes so that we identified and see their spatial organization. So we can not only determine the uh, spatial organization of cells, we can also determine their function by co-imaging with uh, neuronal activity markers. And in this case, uh, we used uh, immediate early genes uh, whose expression is induced by behavior stimulations as uh, activity markers. So for example, in this case, uh, we uh, let the uh, animal to have the parenting behavior and afterwards we sacrifice the animal and do the MRFISH imaging. But in the MRFISH imaging gene panel, we include the immediate early gene CFOS to indicate which neurons are activated or were activated by the parenting behavior. And then you can see in this field of view, those are the red neurons that, that express a uh, elevated level of CFOS. And of course, we have our cell marker gene panel uh, that it, currently the colors are all shown in a single color blue for all the RNAs. But if I show a couple of genes in different colors, then you can see these uh, uh, red cells that are activated by parenting behavior is of a specific type that shows uh, uh, 
preferential expression of these uh, uh, receptors, calcitonin receptor and bombating, bomb, uh, bombating receptor 3. So we actually use this approach to look at the neurons that are activated by a uh, set of different social behaviors, including parenting, aggression, and mating, and for animals that are of different sexes and in different physiological states. Uh, this is a lot of information here, and obviously I don't have time to go through all of them, so let me just briefly talk about one anecdote. So it's actually known that uh, when exposed to pups, uh, virgin female males uh, can exhibit parenting behavior, and so do mothers and fathers. But interestingly, virgin male mice uh, do not exhibit parenting behavior. Instead, it actually is uh, aggressive and then can kill pups. So interestingly, out of the some 70 type of uh, uh, neuronal subtypes, so we identified to one uh, stimulate with a parenting behavior, a single type of uh, neuron, this inhibitory neuronal type 14 or I14, was activated by exposure to pup in virgin female. And then uh, this actually is a cell type that expresses uh, interesting molecules such as gallonin, calcitonin receptor, and bombasin receptor. And we call this uh, the parenting cluster or parenting cell type. And the, you can see that the cell cluster is also activated in mothers and fathers. But in mothers and fathers, there are additional uh, subtypes of neurons that are significantly activated as indicated by these red bars. And the, the interesting one that's activated in both fathers and mothers is this inhibitory neuronal cluster 10, I10, that express oxytocin, a molecule that is known to be important for social interactions. And then we also found uh, clusters that are specifically activated in moms and other, uh, clusters that are specifically activated in dads. And uh, uh, notably, as you can see, that this parenting cluster I14 is not activated in virgin male when it's exposed to pups. Uh, explains why virgin male do not exhibit parenting behavior. Uh, but what instead was activated is the inhibitory cluster I16, which is also activated when the animal is exposed to other adult uh, males, which then a, will in, elicit aggression behavior, and uh, you know, so which is consistent with the <clears throat> observation that uh, virgin male, when exposed to pups, also exhibits uh, aggression behavior. And won't go into details, but we also identified the specific clusters that are activated uh, uh, in female and male mice uh, during uh, mating. So just to uh, summarize this part, we uh, observed that genetically encoded circuits are comprised of uh, transcriptionally distinct neuronal types that control uh, specific uh, hypothalamic functions. So let me switch gears now, talk about uh, our recent work on generating the cell atlas uh, for the primary motor cortex uh, of mouse brain. And this is actually part of the BICCN consortium effort. And BICCN early on chose the primary motor cortex, or MOP, as the initial target brain region for a comprehensive mapping by a multitude of uh, different experimental uh, modalities, uh, such as uh, single-cell transcriptomic profiling, single-cell epigenomic profiling, uh, spatially resolved uh, uh, single-cell transcriptomics uh, using MERFISH, and also the uh, epiretroseq method that can allow the direct, the, they can allow the uh, measurement of uh, both epigenetic profiles and uh, uh, retrograde tracing, and the combination of uh, cash clamp with uh, transcriptome profiling, and then also methods that are um, you know, these uh, cell type targeting tools and other methods and so on. Altogether, uh, the idea is to get a comprehensive understanding of the cell types, their organization and function in this important brain region. So this has been a really exciting collaboration for us. So uh, I will talk about our Murphish effort. In this case, so we imaged the 255 genes in the MOP, the primary motor cortex. And these genes are, again, a combination of the known cell type markers and the markers identified by single cell RNA sequencing. And uh, as you can see, 
that, uh, again, we get really high uh, image quality. Here you can see individual cells in the field of view and individual RNA molecules uh, that are identified with the correct barcodes. So uh, using this approach, uh, and from the single cell gene expression profiles detected by MRFISH, again, we used the clustering algorithm and then identified about uh, three different cell classes, uh, 25, 23 subclasses of cells, and then 95 clusters. So let me elaborate. So this uh, three different cell classes are the uh, excitatory glutamatergic excitatory, uh, neurons and the inhibitory GABAergic neurons and the non-neuronal uh, cells. And the, the, each one of these classes are uh, uh, divided into subclasses. For example, in the excitatory subclasses, uh, we can see these uh, different subclasses of uh, different projection properties, uh, such as uh, the uh, uh, IT cells, uh, the intratelosophonic neurons, the ET cells, uh, the extratelosophonic neurons, the cortical thalamic projecting neurons, and so on and so forth. And then in the uh, inhibitory neurons, we can see the subclasses uh, marked by uh, known marker genes such as pavalbumin, SST, VIP, SNGCG, and then 5 so, and these are, can also be grouped by their uh, development origin into NGE-derived cells and CGE-derived cells. And then uh, a lot of the uh, non-neuronal cells, such as the oligodendrocytes, uh, immature oligodendrocytes, astrocytes, and so on and so forth. And then again, when compared with uh, single-cell RNA sequencing uh, that is taken inside the BICC in effort, uh, we again get to very good correspondence. But we also see that there are some fine splittings by MRFISH that are det not detected just by the uh, single cell uh, sequencing or the fine splitting that are detected by sequencing, uh, single cell RNA sequencing, but not by MRFISH and so on. But overall, there's pretty good correspondence. And then I won't have time to explain, but there's uh, good reasons of uh, why there's uh, fine splittings uh, that are detected one way but not the other. But again, uh, because of the uh, direct spatial measurement, and we can map out to the spatial organizations of uh, the neurons, and here is all 95 uh, different, uh, uh, oh, I should also say here that uh, these 23 subclasses are then all finally split into each individual uh, classes are finally split into multiple clusters, and altogether there's 95 different uh, clusters of cells. And then here is a plot of the spatial organization of the 95 different clusters uh, that are uh, uh, in one coronal slice. And, uh, and you can see that you can see this beautiful laminar structure. And then the appearance of that is primarily dominated by the uh, laminar organization of the glutamatergic neurons, because GABAergic neurons uh, is a uh, relatively sparse uh, in this uh, uh, region. And then, uh, so we mapped out the spatial organization of excitatory, inhibitory, and non-neuronal cells. And then their composition, you can see that indeed the neurons are dominated by glutamatergic neurons. And uh, I should say that interestingly, even though the GABAergic cells are not so abundant, because we can measure their location with a high resolution and know each cell their type, we can actually get a um, highly quantitative spatial distribution of these neurons. And then they actually show very interesting layered organization too, with many of the inhibitory neuronal clusters or GABAergic neuronal clusters to be uh, preferentially resided in one or two of the cortical layers. And of course, uh, the uh, excitatory neurons also show layered organization with the IT cells spanning pretty much the entire cortical depth uh, from L23, the layer 23, all the way to layer 6, while these ET and P near projecting neurons, CT, and so on, they're in the deeper layers. And uh, interestingly, we also see that at the excited, uh, at the, the excitatory neurons can actually subdivide cortical layers. I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, here, if we look at the layer 5 extra telecephalic neuron or ET neuron, 
and then it's divided into five clusters. And it has very interesting spatial organization with clusters one and three actually uh, are populated in the upper part of the layer five, while cluster five is populated in the lower part of layer five. And uh, the cluster four is actually only on the lateral side of the uh, 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 primary motor cortex and near the uh, somatosensory cortex. And then uh, combining our results with other experiments in the BICCN effort, uh, we actually see that these uh, lower, lower layer five uh, cluster five is actually specific uh, modula, uh, modula projecting type of neurons. Next, uh, let's look at a, a large group of excitatory neurons, the uh, IT cells, or uh, the intratelocephalic neurons. The IT cells is the largest group of neurons in the MOP, which is divided into several subclasses, L23 IT, L45 IT, L5 IT, and L6 IT. Now, interestingly, although the motor cortex was traditionally considered lacking a distinct layer four due to the absence of clear cytoarchitecture features, we actually observed a population of uh, IT neurons in the MOP made of uh, five clusters that spatially reside between L23IT and L5IT subclasses suggesting the presence of layer four-like neurons in the MOP. And we call these L45IT neurons here. Uh, additional experiments uh, concurrently happening in the uh, BICCN consortium also provided other evidence uh, for the L4, uh, layer four-like neurons in the MOP. And then this finding is also consistent with work from Gordon Shepard's lab reporting L4-like neurons in the MLP based on their anatomical and uh, connectivity properties. Also, looking at the clusters of these IT subclasses, for example, here, here, and here in the L6, uh, we can again see that the excitatory neuronal clusters uh, subdivide cortical layers. In fact, the expression profile and the spatial distributions show that IT cells that do not form discrete, well-separated clusters. In the UMAP, we can see that these clusters form connecting patches, except for this uh, small, distinct L6 IT CAR3 cluster. Moreover, the spatial distributions of these neurons, shown here, uh, overlap with each other and gradually move from layer two, three to layer six. Now to find out the relationship between gene expression and profile and spatial position of individual neurons, we calculated a pseudo time quantity based on the expression profiles of individual neurons. So basically cells with more similar gene expression profiles will be closer in pseudo time. Now, in the scattered plot of individual cells on the two-dimensional space of pseudo-time and cortical depth, we see that our IT neurons form a continuous cloud rather than discrete clusters. And the pseudo-time is highly correlated with the cortical depths for individual cells. Now, next, we identify genes which are differentially expressed in cells of a different cortical depth. And we found about 120 of them plotting that, that plotting their expression profiles out for individual neurons and ordering the cells uh, based on their cortical depth and ordering the genes uh, based on the cortical depths at which they exhibit maximum expression. Again, we can see that the gene expression profile of cells show a more or less gradual change over cortical depth. And we have a similar plot to when the cortical depth is replaced by uh, pseudo time. So taken together, our results show that quite remarkably, the IT cells, which accounts for more than 70% of the total excitatory neurons in the MOP, forms a continuous spectrum of cells instead of discrete, discrete clusters. In our spatially resolved single cell profiling, showed concurrent gradual changes of IT cells 
both in the expression, gene expression space and in real space, and uh, with a, a strong correlation between the expression profile of individual neurons and their cortical depth. And these results uh, revealed a uh, continuous molecular and spatial gradient of IP cells spanning nearly the entire cortical depth. Now, finally, in the last few slides, I would like to talk about an exciting technology advance that allows us to measure the projection properties of these in-situ identified neurons, i.e., which region of the brain these neurons target to, which is key to connect their molecular profile to their function. To do this, we integrate MRFISH with retrograde tracing, and then we inject dye-labeled retrograde tracers, the chlorotoxin B, into various brain regions, and we developed a protocol that allow us to measure both the retrograde label and the MRFISH genes in the same neurons which that allows us to simultaneously determine the cell type identity through their uh, expression profiles and spatial organization of the cells, as well as their projection targets with single cell resolution. To demonstrate this capability, we chose uh, three uh, brain regions, uh, the uh, secondary motor cortex, MOS, the primary somatosensory cortex, SSP, and the temporal association area, TEA, as target regions, and inject uh, the retrograde tracers into these regions. And then here, a typical integrated MRFISH and retrograde tracer image look like this, showing the source neurons uh, projection target, here shown in three colors for the three targets, and the cell type identity here shown in different colors. So due to time limit, I won't be able to describe all detailed results, but I'll only highlight some findings here. We observed that each of these three target regions uh, receives uh, inputs from many different neuronal clusters. You can see actually here only 10 are, the top 10 are shown. There are actually more than 10 clusters per target region. And these are all from IT cells and L6B cells. Now, in addition, each of these IT or L6B clusters also projects to multiple regions. So uh, what we see here is that, that the projections of um, MLP neurons uh, to other cortical regions uh, do not seem to follow a one cell type to one target region rule, but form an interesting many-to-many -many network with underlying specificity Namely, each region receives input from a different composition of clusters. Interestingly, in some cases, we found that molecularly and spatially similar IT clusters that can have very different and yet highly specific projection targets. For example, looking at uh, these uh, layer six IT uh, neurons, we can see that uh, layer uh, L6 IT3 cluster mostly target TEA, but not MOS or SSP, where L6 IT1 cluster mostly target MOS. And uh, conversely, uh, MOS mostly receive uh, input uh, from L6 IT1 cluster. You see MO6 primarily in, uh, receives input from L6 one, uh, L6IT1 cluster, but not L6IT2 or 3 cluster. And the TA mostly receives input from L6IT3 cluster. Now, given that all three clusters have a similar expression profile and highly overlapping spatial distribution, it is remarkable that they can have such distinct projection properties. Now, how such distinct projection properties can arise from these neurons with similar molecular and spatial properties? For example, whether it comes from a developmental origin is an interesting question for a future study. So hopefully, although uh, described briefly, I hope these slides uh, convey the richness of the information that can be obtained from such uh, experiments. In the end, I would like to emphasize that for both studies the high throughput of MRFISH. In the MOP study, we profiled 
300,000 cells, and in the preoptic region, we profiled more than a million cells. So to summarize, uh, in these two examples, I presented our efforts in using single-cell transcriptome imaging by Murfish to generate molecularly defined and spatially resolved cell atlas uh, of brain regions. In combination with the uh, neuronal activity marker imaging and retrograde labeling, we also <clears throat> added functional annotations to the cells in one case and projection annotations to the cells in the other case. Now, many other properties can also be measured by imaging, such as the morphology of neurons. And also, in addition to using immediate early genes, uh, neuronal activity can also be imaged by calcium and voltage indicators. As we know, many imaging methods are intrinsically compatible to be done on the same samples, either simultaneously or sequentially while preserving samples between measurements. So uh, in the future, it would be really exciting to combine all these different imaging modalities to simultaneously probe the molecular, spatial, anatomical, and functional properties of individual cells and create such what I call molecular, spatial, connectional, and functional cell atlas of the brain, which hopefully will greatly expedite our understanding of how different cell types are organized and connected to form functional neural circuits in the brain. So finally, let me thank the people who have done the work. And the Murfish technology development has gone through multiple generations of hardworking students and postdocs. In the interest of time, let me not enumerate them all out all here. But I'll only specifically acknowledge the people uh, who are involved in the work of uh, mapping the two brain regions. For the hypothalamic uh, preoptic region, uh, in my lab, the work was uh, primarily done by Jeff Moffat, a former postdoc, and Steve Ahorn, a current postdoc. And as I mentioned, this is a very nice collaboration with uh, Catherine Dulock's lab, a, a nice and close collaboration where uh, our two labs basically work together day in and day out. And we're also very appreciative of uh, the help from Aviv Regev who taught us uh, how to do self-clustering and shared unpublished uh, clustering software with us. And the primary motor cortex work is uh, primarily done by uh, postdoc Meng Jan and uh, Steve Ahorn. And this is a nice collaboration with Hongwei Zhang's lab at USC uh, on the retrograde tracing front, and also with uh, Hongwei Zhang's lab at Allen Brain Institute, uh, who shared with us uh, uh, single cell RNA sequencing analysis results, and together with us designed the Murfish gene panels. And this work is uh, supported by NIH, in particular the BICCN U19 programs, and by uh, HHMI. And I also have a uh, disclosure to make. I'm a co-founder of this gene. And uh, now uh, I would like to thank you for your attention and open up for questions. Uh, so the first question is, how many genes can you image? And how do you determine the number of genes to be imaged? Uh, yeah, so uh, is my voice on? Can you yes. hear me? OK, good. Yes. Yeah, so how many genes? There is not really a uh, limit. So as I have shown in the talk that in one of our published work, we have already demonstrated uh, uh, imaging of 10,050 genes, but we can certainly do more. Uh, uh, what that need is means uh, we can do it by uh, using longer barcodes, uh, more hybridi hybridization rounds, or we could actually even not necessarily increase uh, that uh, bit number, but just uh, increase the density of the molecules that we can simultaneously image in one round by super resolution approaches. For example, using uh, expansion uh, of the cell as we have also demonstrated uh, uh, by, uh, you know, I mean, we have already demonstrated the ability in published work to combine expansion microscopy with MRFish. 
So as you can see from this, you know, per round, how many genes you can image with, uh, with but still uh, resolve the molecules is one requirement. But that can be done by either super resolution or by uh, doing more rounds of imaging. Uh, there are some other limitations, not necessarily on the number, you know, uh, but on, for example, what kind of genes you can image. Some genes can be a bit short, and then if they cannot accommodate a sufficient number of fish probes and hence their sig signal does not rise above background, those short genes can be hard to image. And the, also some of the genes uh, may express at a very low level and such a low level that their signal, I mean, the number of molecules we detect, it does not rise above a false positive. That could also be hard. But that limit is, is actually, we're very sensitive. Uh, our sensitivity is very high because we can detect less than one, on average, less than one copy per cell, that kind of a level. So, so that's, that's basically on the gene. So you, your other question is how many genes uh, do we want to image, right? You know, for any particular problem, you said, you know, how do we decide on the number of genes? Uh, that we often use prior knowledge. For example, you know, if we have the single cell RNA sequencing data to say that there are these many clusters, and then we identify the marker genes, uh, meaning this, the, the genes that are differentially expressed between uh, different clusters. And then was that, uh, we can actually design a set of genes. And we found for a particular brain region, often a few hundred genes is quite sufficient in determining high granularity uh, in cell, cell type composition and so on. So there, as uh, both work we've shown, uh, we got pretty high correspondence uh, with uh, the single cell RNA sequencing. Without that prior data, it'd be good to use uh, substantially more genes to, to actually, uh, you know, make sure that we can cover all cell types. And that's possible. Uh, thanks. One, another very interesting question. Um, can you image uh, dynamic changes in gene expression, such as, for example, diurnal variability? And if so, what is the level of change that you require for it to be detectable? Yeah, so that I think we can because, uh, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Murfish is a uh, uh, pretty uh, sensitive uh, approach, and then it has uh, the detection efficiency is nearly 100 percent, and that it can detect uh, pretty quantitatively the gene expression level. So, on the order of uh, a few tenths of percentage of a change, uh, I would say should be detectable. And even less than that would be detectable technically. But on the other hand, one do want to pay attention to the biological, uh, for example, animal to animal noise, right? So, so if you measure different animals, uh, these uh, gene expression are already changing from one animal to the other. Then we need to have also the uh, uh, state dependent changes, such as uh, the gene expression to be higher at one time of the day than the other time of the day, that level change need to rise above the animal to animal uh, variability. So those we need to do some control experiment to find out and then, but technically it is a very sensitive and quantitative approach should be uh, a pretty good method, uh, powerful method used for detecting that kind of uh, uh, gene expression profile change. A technical question is, uh, what spatial resolution can this technique achieve? It's actually very high resolution. So, uh, you know, we can detect, uh, uh, I mean, using a technical term, it's actually subdiffraction limit resolution. So, so going back to the super resolution work that we've done, you know that the diffraction limit uh, limits the uh, the resolution of light microscopy to 200 micro. I mean, I'm sorry, 200 nanometers of a resolution. Uh, but in this Murfish, we can achieve better than 200 nanometers. It's a little bit similar in a sense uh, to our storm work that the neighboring molecules. Uh, we don't turn on them simultaneously so that they can be resolved at different time. In STORM, we use the switching. Actually, in Murfish, some of these molecules are not detected in the same hybridization rounds. So then they can be separately localized. So we often get 100 nanometer resolution. And even better than that should be possible. 
And this question is slightly um, similar to the one on dynamic changes, but it's very specific and it's asking, can you measure activity dependent gene expression changes in neurons? Yeah, we do. We 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 do certainly can. And uh, for example, using the the this uh, uh, preoptic region as an example, there we expo we we let the animal to exert or exhibit certain activity, and then we can uh, uh, map the the brain the preoptic region. And then there we look at you know the the cells that are activated in CFOS. But then we can actually cluster the animals that are naive and the animals that had the activity uh, together. And then we often find that we can still see the same cell types uh, that are, you know, both a naive animal and an animal that exhibited behavior. Because we can classify them as the same cell types or cell, same cell clusters, then we can compare for any gene of interest whether that expression level changed for the animals that exhibited uh, activity, not only that for the neurons that actually has been activated as shown by a CFOS positive uh, signature. So with that, we can clearly measure the activity dependent gene changes. Now, and in that experiment, uh, a question is you're looking at the CFOS differences uh, when these animals are exposed in these behaviors, whether it's mating, aggression, um, or parenting, but have you seen differences between males and females in the type of neurons in these hypothalamic regions? Are there yeah, right. I think it's basically asking for uh, sexual dimorphism. Yes, we actually do. And uh, it is a very interesting uh, direction that uh, you know, uh, I, uh, that, that we can do more. We have not emphasized that, but indeed it's something that we observed and it's indeed something that we can do. Uh, there's a technical question here that's asking you, how can you tell which neurons that are retrogradely labeled with CTB by Murphish? How can you tell which neurons? Oh, the, so basically the retrograde tracing does like this. You know, I apologize if I have not explained clearly in the talk. So we uh, inject retrograde tracer CTB into a target region. And then the CTB, the chlorotoxin is, is already dye labeled. And it retrogradely travel to the source neuron. So in that source neuron, if we measured, for example, a uh, red dye labeled CTB signal, then we know that was targeted to the uh, TA region. If it's a green dye labeled, uh, you know, CTP signal detected in that neuron, we know that neuron actually projects to the MOS region. So that retrograde tracer signal, CTP signal, is first measured, and then we uh, have the label label the samples with the Murphish genes, and then do the Murphish imaging. So then this way we can, on the same set of samples, same set of neurons, both determine the retrograde label and its gene expression profile. Then there is another technical question, and it's, uh, does the imaging involve many steps of labeling and washing to label large amounts of genes? Yes, it does include multiple rounds of uh, labeling. So what we typically do, you know, is uh, there is an initial round of labeling we call encoding labeling. There we place these encoding probes on the genes and then the encoding label basically physically imprint the barcode we assigned to the genes. Uh, what, how, how it works is the encoding probes can hybridize to the gene, to the RNA, and it has the readout sequences that are exactly uh, designed to be corresponding to the barcodes. And then we read out the readout sequences that are present. And then if it is a 16-bit barcode, that means we need to do 16 rounds of uh, readout probing with uh, complementary readout probes that are exactly complementary to the 16 readout sequences that each corresponds to one bit. Now, if it's 16-bit, then we do do 16. Uh, we, if we do single color imaging, it's 16 rounds of hybridization. But we often do two or three colors of imaging. So that makes it eight rounds of hybridization or, uh, you know, seven, six rounds of hybridization. So then you can do the mass. If it's a 21 bit and you do three color, then that's a seven rounds of hybridization and labeling. And those we actually have automatic uh, fluid 
to fluidic system uh, on our setup, they just automatically do that while the imaging is uh, being synchronized and uh, acquired. Then uh, a question that again is um, based on technical, which is it says, I have a naive conceptual question. What is the definition of a cell type? Do I understand correctly that any difference in transcriptome would imply neurons that are of a different type? That's a very good question. <laughs> I think that's the that's a question that uh, the whole field is uh, trying to find an answer exactly how to define a cell type and uh, can you define cell type purely based on the uh, gene expression profile change? And uh, let me put it this way, gene expression profile can change not only because the cell changes type, but also can change when the cell changes state, right? For example, activity can lead to uh, changes uh, and uh, you know, cell cycles can lead to changes and so on. So uh, I would say that uh, it takes uh, you know, a combination of uh, different approaches in the particular case uh, in, uh, in neurobiology that to measure both the, you know, the, the gene expression profiles and the morphology of the neurons, like the electrophysiology, physiological properties of the neurons, and the, the projection, the circuit connectivity uh, properties, uh, the function, all these eventually uh, to determine you know, cell types and so on. That said, I think uh, transcriptome profiling is a very good starting point because it's a very systematic approach and it is a quantitative approach. So because of that, uh, you know, we can get these different cell populations and a lot of them do reflect the different types. And then we can do further study in combination with other modality of measurement, as I've already demonstrated in this talk, that we combine that with functional activity and with projection. We can also combine, as I alluded to, with other pro properties. A lot of them can be measured also by imaging, such as morphology, you know, the shape and uh, things like that. So, so with that, we can then uh, using this uh, initial starting point of cell clusters to further delineate which one of these are cell type change, uh, cell, different cell types and which one of those clusters uh, only reflect cell state changes. Thanks. Uh, another technical question, did you have observed certain cells having dual projections to both MOs and SSPs? Do they have unique transcription signatures or enriching specific clusters? So uh, that's a very good question. I can answer this way. So the we do have observation of uh, the same cluster of cells, certainly, even the, the cells that are very nearby spatially and belong to the same cluster can project both to MOS and SSP. And do we have observation, if the question asks for, is that is there one particular cell, that exact cell actually projected two regions? Uh, I actually need to uh, further look into the data to, to answer that question. So it's not something that I know off the top of my head. And do we have unique transcription signature uh, or enriched in specific? Yes, so unique may be too strong to say. The projection, as I try to emphasize, is a very interesting pattern. That's a, what we call a many-to-many. -many. So we, what we often find is that one target region can receive input from many clusters. And one cluster can project to many different target regions. And yet that doesn't mean it's a mess without any rules. So we do see the specificity of a specific composition or combination of clusters that project to a certain region. On top of that, sometimes we even, as I alluded to, to have very similar molecularly similar and spatially similar cells that project distinctly to two different regions. Now, what give rise to these uh, uh, is what I said, you know, is an interesting question for the future. And uh, have you used MERFISH for uh, doing studies to characterize astrocytes and their interactions with neurons? Uh, 
Yeah, that's another very good question. So uh, in all our uh, brain murfish images, uh, there are non-neuronal cells and certainly astrocytes. And uh, it is a very interesting thing to dig deeper into these images uh, to examine the, the astrocytes neuron interaction. While we currently have focused more on neurons, but that's, some, that's a direction we're interested in. Now, a, a question related to the hypothalamic findings, where you are actually elegantly documenting differences between males and females as it relates to parenting, rearing, but uh, you only reported data on aggression for the males was, and nothing on the females. So was it because the females did not experience aggressive behaviors or, or were there other reasons? <laughs> Yeah, so uh, that's an interesting question. So uh, uh, my collaborator, Catherine Dulac, probably can answer that question better, you know. So we have, uh, uh, obviously, in these studies, definitely have uh, males exposed to pop and males exposed to adult male. We have also female exposed to pop and female exposed to uh to uh, to adult male and uh, in the female exposed to pop case uh, we see the parenting behavior in the female exposed to the adult male at least to what we quantified as the mating behavior you know whether there were ever some incidences of aggression I don't know <laughs> we have to ask her and her postdocs whether they observed that. Yeah, that was an interesting question. I mean, one that we cannot forego now that we are seeing aggression surrounding us, unfortunately. Now, there's another question that um, came here that you may have answered it to a certain extent, which relates to, um, first of all, they say, this is very exciting work. And they ask, can you detect dynamic changes or is it a one-time measure? Well, technically, these uh, measurements, that one measurement that you do is a one-time measure, right? Because these are fixed cells that are fixed at a specific time point. And then the measurements you measure reflect that time point. Nonetheless, uh, you know, dynamic changes is something that is possible that one can imagine two different approaches uh, that we've actually taken. So you could take different time points after a certain initial time point, or uh, especially a stimulation, you can, you know, get your sample at different time points and then measure. Or in some cases, uh, we often find that uh, we could do pseudo time, pseudo timing of the cells. That can also infer uh, dynamic changes. For example, in one of our work, what we actually uh, did is pseudo timing that reflect a cell cycle dependent changes. Uh, you know, in the what we see is say, if we actually this is very interesting. If we actually take advantage of our spatial resolution, we can resolve well, what genes are in the nucleus, what genes are in the cytoplasm. You know, the RNA composition. And since RNAs are born in the nucleus and then exported on, into the cytoplasm, so then if you actually get the balance between these two, you can actually pseudo time the cell cycle point of the of the of the cells and then there we can actually see a lot of cell cycle dependent or uh, the gene a lot of genes their expression levels depends on cell cycle and of course pseudo timing can be used for not only that but also for uh, development and and so on differentiation if you go to sort of the early days of development of the animal so through that kind of a measurement at different physical time points or the pseudo timing one will be able to infer this kind of a dynamic changes. Yeah, it's incredible work. I mean, it's just amazing. So, so congratulations. And, 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 and would you, if you, as you're looking at the work, uh, where do you want to bring it next to? And what are some of the challenges that you would like to resolve? Yeah, so, uh, so the, the, method after you know years of development is uh, already at a point that we can use it to, to solve or to tackle a lot of uh, biological questions and the brain related question is uh, one area that i'm particularly interested in 
But then one could also imagine uh, using this tool to get the cell atlas of all kinds of uh, different uh, organs and uh, in different organisms. One could also use that for disease-related studies. And then one thing that is, uh, you know, one good example, for example, is to do uh, uh, cancer-related studies, to look at the tumor microenvironment, to look at the interaction between uh, healthy cells and uh, tumor cells, and uh, to look at the interaction between tumor cells and immune cells. Uh, and then to study the drug responses and so on. So there are a lot of, and then, you know, there are also a lot of, clearly a lot of biological, I mean, development related questions that can be addressed or was this kind of a tool to look at how cell types develop and uh, also cell differentiation questions. And technically, uh, indeed, there are still a, a advances, uh, you know, even though I say that, uh, there's not really a limit necessarily on how many genes, but I did mention some of the genes are uh, like the sh very short genes uh, that are still difficult to detect and so on. And then there are also interesting questions that are related to, to the sequence length. For example, uh, you know, you know, the, 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 uh, uh, The 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 splice the splice variants, for example, right? Isoforms mm -hmm. and so on. So so uh, there are really still it's it's still a relatively new direction that there are a lot of uh, technical advances that can still happen. Well, I want to thank you very much for that terrific uh, talk and give you an opportunity. Is there anything else that you would have like anyone to ask you that you want to leave us with? Oh, I Any think questions? we have uh, had uh, a lot of questions already and then it had uh, already run over time. So I just want to thank all the people who has uh, listened to the talk and uh, showed interest. And, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's a great pleasure to, uh, to, to present our work uh, in this platform. And uh, not only I want to thank the uh, audience, but also uh, thank you, uh, Nora, so much for uh, doing this fantastic job of monitoring. And uh, also, I'd like to thank the technical teams uh, of LabRoot and the NIH to uh, make all this possible. You know, we're all learning on how to do remote conferencing. So uh, this is a uh, uh, interesting experience and uh, really a lot of work from the technical support people to make this possible. So I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them. Thanks very much.